Hello aspirants, welcome to the daily editorial analysis brought by Shankar IS Academy. Today, 26th October 2024. Displayed here are the articles that we are going to discuss today. The first article, Fair Trade, it is taken from the newspaper The Hindu. This is talking about the India's aim to establish a transparent carbon trade policy ahead of the upcoming 29th COP in Azerbaijan Baku. And the second article, Sharpening the Anti-Defection Law, Strengthen Democracy. This editorial is taken from the newspaper The Hindu. It is talking about the importance of enhancing the anti-defection law to reduce its limitations and loophole. This article, it is taken from the Hindu newspaper. And the third article, Stringing Pockets. This article is talking about the reduced demand in India. This article is taken from the newspaper, The Indian Express. So without much delay, let's begin with our first article. Look at this newspaper article, Fair Trade, India must develop a transparent carbon trade policy. So this article is talking about India aim to establish a transparent carbon trade policy ahead of the 29th conference of parties which is going to be held in Azerbaijan on the November 11 on 11th November 2024. So let us discuss more about the carbon trade and its role in the fight against the climate change. So before moving into the carbon trade we have to understand about a concept called carbon credit. So what is carbon credit? We have already discussed this carbon credit is a permit which represents the right to emit one metric ton of carbon or equivalent greenhouse gas. So, how this carbon credit work that also we discussed imagine that there are two companies this is a steel company and this is a cement company both are emitting carbons and before establishing this companies there will be proper assessment and as, as per this assessment the steel company can emit up to 10 ton of carbon or they have 10 carbon credit. So, one carbon credit is equal to one ton of carbon right. So, the steel company can emit 10 ton of carbon that means they have a 10 carbon credit. And the cement company, they, they, their cap or their limitation is at a 7 carb metric ton of carbon. So, what happens? After the production, the steel company emitted only 7 ton. That means, they utilized only their 7 credits. They have a remaining of 3 credits and the cement company exceeded the limit and produced an emission of 10 metric ton. So, what happens? This time to maintain the balance, the cement company can purchase the carbon credit from steel company. So, this will maintain an overall balance in the ecosystem. So, this is how the carbon credit works. So, what is mean by carbon markets? Carbon markets is the platform or a place where the companies or entities can purchase and sell the carbon credits. So, there are two type of carbon markets. First one is compliance. Another one is voluntary markets. Compliance market. It is regulated by the government and the industries must limit their emission. And if they exceed the limit, then they have to purchase the carbon credit. This is how these compliance markets work. But in the case of voluntary markets, here the companies are free to purchase and sell the carbon credits based on their voluntary interest. So, this is this is a major difference between compliance and the voluntary markets. And recently, uh, our financial minister also mentioned about the importance of carbon credit trading system. And uh, we are trying to establish a carbon credit trading system with with the essence of both the compliance markets as well as voluntary markets. And this voluntary markets are very useful in ensuring uh, ecological balance as well as it will also promote corporate social responsibility. And what is the role of India in the carbon market? India is a major player in voluntary carbon markets with exporting carbon worth of dollar 200 to 300 billion. And it comes around 17 percentage of global carbon credit supply as of 2022. Now, we are going to see certain initiatives taken by the government of India to develop a carbon market. First one is the carbon credit trading scheme and it is a structured carbon market which is expected to be op operational from 25-26 and, and India is trying to establish a compliance model of carbon market but it will also allow non-mandatory or voluntary based purchase and sale of carbon credit. Then we have perform, achieve and trade that is also known as PAT. It is a market based mechanism to promote energy efficiency in industries and this PAT allows the industries exceeding the limit to purchase the carbon credit. And then we have the renewable energy certificates. This initiative supports the development of renewable energy at the same time development of renewable energy by allowing the companies and entities by selling certificates, trade certificates representing the generation of renewable energy. And this initiative will also reduce dependence on fossil fuel. And finally, we have the for monitoring and verification, we have the Bureau of Energy Efficiency and the National Steering Committee for Indian Carbon Market. And they enforce the transparency 
and protects the integrity of the Indian carbon market through strict evaluation, verification and monitoring. Now we are going to see the advantages of implementing carbon tax. So this is another initiative to reduce the carbon footprint. So carbon tax is a financial charge levied on products or companies or based on their emission. So what will be the advantages of implementing the carbon tax? The first major advantage is green innovation. That is the implementation or imposition of this carbon tax will encourage the companies to adopt clean technology and invest in green developments. And then we have the revenue for climate resilience. Yes, through imp implementing the carbon tax, we can find a fund for climate adaptation projects like flood protection. And implementation of carbon tax rate will also have a positive impact on public health because the companies will be encouraged to adopt clean energy and this adoption of the clean energy will reduce the air pollution. Therefore, it will improve the pulmonary and cardiovascular health of the people. And as per the estimation of International Monetary Fund, the carbon tax rate will play a significant role in reducing thousands of premature death caused due to air pollution. And the final advantage is sustainable consumption. Yes, through implementing the carbon tax, through implementing the carbon tax, we can generate awareness. Therefore, the people will be aware about eco-friendly products and they will shift their consumer choices. Now, we are going to see the challenges associated with the implementation of carbon tax in India. The first major impact is on economy. That is, it will increase the production cost and affect the competitiveness in energy intensive sectors such as steel and cement because they are the most emitters of carbon tax right? but this implementation of carbon tax will discourage these sectors and then we have a regressive impact yes the implementation of the carbon tax can bring a negative impact in the lower income groups because they are spending more money on energy and then we have a limited scope because the carbon tax is primarily focusing on CO2 that is carbon dioxide while other greenhouse gases such as methane are less addressed in the carbon taxation. And another challenge is the informal sector because India we know that it is a vast nation and uh, it, we, we have a relatively business friendly ambience therefore regulating you know small and unregistered business is a remaining challenge before implementation of this carbon tax. And the next uh, key challenge is the interstate disparities. We know that in, in India is a diverse nation, therefore uh, certain nations, particularly the central Indian nations are depending on natural resources and mining activities for their economic growth. Therefore, the implementation of this carbon tax will reduce such carbon intensive or energy intensive activities in such areas. Therefore, it will lead to interstate disparities among the states and that will bring burden on coal dependent states. Therefore, a regional consideration is very important before implementing the carbon taxation. And the next challenge is the carbon leakage. That means even though we are implementing strict regulations within the country, there is a possibility that these industries will shift their production to countries with weak regulations. For example, the, the, if, if we are imposing strict carbon regulation in India, the industries may shift their production to Africa or, or Latin America. So, this can lead to carbon leakage. And the implementation of carbon tax can also Im impact the international trade. For example, other countries are imposing heavy carbon tax, then it will impact India's export. Therefore, the carbon tax can affect the international trade. So, this managing the carbon is a challenge. So, what can be done? So, let us see that. First one is, we have to go for a phased implementation of the carbon policies. That is, we have to give time for the transition. Therefore, the industries can adopt to the changing uh, regulations as well as monitoring. Then we have the border carbon adjustments. This will helpful in preventing carbon leakage. And at the same time, it will also protect the domestic products. And the next step can be incentives for technological transfer. That is the collected carbon tax can be used for funding programs for small and medium enterprises to adopt clean technologies. And then we have the green financing. For example, uh, green boards and uh, climate loans will encourage the business entities and companies to invest in low carbon projects. And the next step can be an integration with the existing schemes. For example, now we have a lot of, you know, different schemes to regulate the carbon. For example, uh, product perform, achieve and trade, renewable energy certificates and a separate uh, carbon credit trading scheme. So, we can integrate these three schemes under one umbrella project. Therefore, it will reduce confusions and we can 
make lot of reforms and it will provide a ease of doing business and then we have the next is the carbon tech incubators that is that is fostering climate innovation through indigenous technology development and then we have the carbon credit cooperatives for small and medium scale enterprises this provides an opportunity for the small and medium scale enterprises to participate in the carbon market through cooperative model this will ensure the regulation of carbon to the grassroots level in this topic we discussed the carbon market the carbon credit system and carbon taxation its advantages and challenges with this idea try to answer this main question the question is how can india establish a well designed carbon market to effectively balance its balance its climate ambitions with economic growth and what strategies should be implemented to promote sustainable development and lead efforts toward a low carbon economy try to answer this main practice question and post it in the comment section we will review and reply for your answer now we will move to the next topic look at this newspaper article sharpen the anti defection law strengthen democracy this article is talking about the importance of strengthening the anti defection law to reduce its loopholes and limitations no doubt anti defection law was a milestone step to ensure the political stability in india but it is time to enhance it so let us discuss more about this from the mains point of view before understanding the anti defection law we have to understand about what is meant by defection so defection can be simply defined as a situation where an elected member changes his alliance or political party for example imagine that there are two political parties political party a and political party b a person contested in the election from political party a and he got elected as mla or mb but after getting elected as mla or mb then he changes the political party that is he shifted his support he switched his support from political party a to political party b seeking monetary benefits or better position within the government this is known as defection actually this is one of the forms of defection there are various other forms of defection for example resignation from the coalition at the same time uh, voting against the resolution of the party it is a defection therefore there are various other forms of defection but this is the, but this is major form of defection if you read the 12th ncert you you will come across a slogan like iram gayaram which refers to an incident in 1967 where the where a person called gayalal which had his party three times in a day so you can read about that incident from the 12th ncert so now we will see the importance of anti defection law so it was added as the 10th schedule in 1985 and through the 52nd amendment to deter mps and mlas from switching political parties like i said the 1967 elections addressed the importance of you know to take steps against the anti defection law so you can notice that this iram gayaram incident also happened in the same year that is in 1967 now we are going to see what are the grounds for disqualification under defection first one is a voluntary resignation from party membership and second one is voting against the party's direction without permission and third one is independent members joining a political party that means if a person got into parliament or state legislative assembly as an independent candidate but later he joining a political party means he is he is acting against the trust of the voters therefore that will also be considered as defection and next is nominated members joining a political party after 6 months in parliament as well as in state legislative assemblies the governors and the president respectively will uh, you know they will nominate members if they are joining political party they will also be considered as defection and group defections are also there for example originally that is un until 2003 if one third members of a party is defecting that will not be considered as as defection but through the 91st amendment the threshold got increased to two third members of the party let's imagine that a party has 100 people if 33 members are switching their alliance before 2003 it will not be considered as defection after 2003 if less than 66 members are defecting or changing or switching their alliance then it will be considered as group defection now we are going to see who has the decision to declare an act is defection or not the speaker or the chairman of the respective house has the power or authority to decide the disqualification cases in the case of lok sabha it is speaker and in the case of rajya sabha it is chairman but the courts they can review the decisions but there is no time limit for these rulings and what are the limitations of this present law there is no penalty for the parties accepting the defectors and at the same time the disqualified members can contest elections again with the with a different party so these are the two major limitations of the anti defection law presently 
Now we are going to see certain challenges associated with the anti-defection law. The first major challenge is delay in decisions. That is, no fixed time frame for the speaker to decide cases related to disqualification. And second is discretionary power for the speaker. That is, the speaker has the authority to decide whether an act is defection or not. Therefore, this has a potential for a delayed or biased rulings. And the next challenge is lack of transparency in the VIPs. We know that VIP means VIP is a position within the political party who maintains the discipline of the members of that particular political party. That is the that opaque process of issuing whips can lead to disputes within the political party and it can also ultimately lead to defection. Moving on, now we are going to see certain Supreme Court rulings regarding the defection. First major case is Kyoto Olohan versus Sakuli and others. This case, this ruling was in the year 1992. In this case, the Supreme Court upheld the validity, upheld the constitutionality of the anti-defection law, citing its importance in protecting the stability of the government. And the next case is G. Vishwanathan was Honorable Speaker, Tamil Nadu Legislative Assembly in 1995. And in this case, the Supreme Court ruled that the Speaker's decision on defection cases is final. They are not subjected to court challenge. And the next major case is Revi S. Nayak was Union of India, 1994. In this case, the Supreme Court ruled that Speaker or Chairman can disqualify. In this case, the Supreme Court confirmed that the Speaker or Chairman can disqualify members for defection. Therefore, this ruling further strengthened the speaker's role as a decision authority. Speaker's role as, a, as an authority of decision making in the case of defection cases. And what are the reforms can be brought to tackle these challenges? The first initiative can be the implementation of recommendation of a second administrative reform commission. It recommended transfer of disqualification power to president or governor advised by the election commission of India. And the second step can be increasing the threshold. So, as uh, we have seen this in the 91st amendment, the, the threshold for group defection got increased from one third to two third. So, and, th and uh, through, we saw that in the, through the, through the increasing the threshold for disqualification, we can reduce the, the split of political parties and defections. And third can be independent oversight in the disqualification cases such as replacing the speaker as the authority of decision making with an independent authority like the election commission of India. Therefore, it will reduce a biased judgment. And the next step can be permitted defections in special cases that is allowing defections in the case of uh, split of political parties or expel or in case a person got expelled from his party. So, in such cases we can permit defections. And the next step can be providing a grace time for the defectors to, to prove their lo loyalty to the newly joined party. And the next step can be joining parties for independence, that is permitting independent members to join parties without disqualification. In this topic, we discussed the defection, anti-law, anti-defection law and its importance and its challenges. So, what can be done uh, from our point of view? The first measure can be a time-bound decision, that is through establishing a time frame for defection cases. This will reduce the biasness in the ruling as well as it will provide political justice. And the next two can be transparent issuance of whips. We already said that the opaque issuance of whips are often a matter of conflict within the political parties which can ultimately lead to defection from that party. Therefore, transparent issuance of whip can bring a re relief. In, in, in the aspect of defection. That can be done through issuing a public notice of whips, for example, through newspaper or mass media. And the next step can be independent tribunal, that is increasing the, that is increasing the role of independent tribunal such as chief election commission uh, in, in the matters regarding the defection cases. So, therefore, it will also bring justice and unbiased ruling. So, these are the steps we can take to ensure any, the integrity in the anti-defection law and strengthen the democracy. So, with this we will move to the mains practice question. The question is the role of individual MPs has diminished over the years as a result healthy constructive debates on policy issues are not usually witnessed. How far can this be attributed to the anti-defection law which was legislated but with a different intention? This question was asked in the year 2023 in UPSC. Try to answer this question and post it in the comment section. Now, we will move to the next topic look at this newspaper article shrinking pocket this article is talking about a recent fall of demand in the middle income households especially in the urban area on the consumer products 
so what will be the reason and what can be done let us start our discussion the reason behind the current decline the first major reason is inflationary pressure we know that during the time of inflation the price level will go high and it will automatically reduce the purchasing power of individuals in the economy and the second major reason is the stagnant income growth if there is a decline or there is a stagnation or there is only limited income then definitely the households will have a tendency to spend that income on essential communities rather than consumer products and the third major reason is the mutated rural and urban demand recently even though the rural demand is 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 showing a kind of recovery due to the good monsoon and all but the urban demand is still weak due to income stagnation and inflationary pressure and the fourth major reason is the shift in the spending pattern due to the premiumization and polarization trend in the market the high income households are still spending more while the low income and the middle income households are restricted from spending in the market and the next reason is the economic uncertainty this is caused due to the anxiety in the people about the future economic stability therefore it will it will automatically increase a tendency to save more rather than spending and the next reason is the higher in interest rate we know that during the time of higher interest rate the people will not borrow money from bank and therefore the borrowing will fall during the time of higher interest rate and it will automatically result in reduced spending and now we are going to see what can be done to revive the condition the first major step can be monetary policy adjustments that includes rate cuttings for example reducing the interest rate to stimulate borrowing and spending in the economy it is a it is a part of expansionary economic policy and second one is inflation target that is targeting the inflation 4 percentage plus or minus 2 will ensure the price stability in the economy and it will also protect the purchasing power of consumers in the economy and the next step can be income support and providing direct benefit transfers that includes expand direct benefit transfers to increase disposable income through direct cash transfer for example pm kisan scheme and other welfare schemes could be scaled up to provide financial assistance to the to the families helping them to manage essential needs and the next includes social welfare schemes which provides targeted support to vulnerable groups the best example is in the morning we discussed uh, mahatma gandhi national rural employment guarantee act this provides 100 days job for unskilled population in the rural area therefore it, through providing employment through providing income we can also maintain the rural demand so in such a targeted social welfare schemes can be scaled up to ensure demand in both urban and rural areas and the next step can be support for employment and income growth that includes encouraging job creation that is that is creating jobs in sectors like agriculture and manufacturing through incentives will have a great potential to boost the economy as well as the income of the people income of the people the best example is production linked incentive scheme as well as making india projects and the next step in, in this in and it also includes reskilling and upskilling to improve workforce skills to enhance employability and income stability the best initiative towards this this path was kaushal vikas yojana and the next in major step can be rationalizing the tax policy that includes lowering gst on essential commodities this will reduce the tax burden on the middle and low income communities therefore they can spend more on essential items as well as consumer goods and the next is income tax relief for the middle class people and this will increase disposable income for the middle income households therefore they can they can demand both essential as well as consumer goods and the next step to boost the demand is through addressing supply chain constraints because we know that the supply chain disruption is one of the major reasons behind the food inflation therefore we can address the supply chain constraints through improving agricultural supply chains and that can be that can be improved through better infrastructure development especially investment in the cold storage better uh, buffer stock management and investment in the field of logistics and this will be helpful in stabilizing food prices and reduce the food inflation and the second is reducing dependence on import for key commodities and this will be helpful in mitigating inflationary pressure on food prices due to global supply chain disruptions because we know that during the time of ukraine russia war the southeast asia witnessed a price hike 
in wheat and rice. So, such a butterfly effects can be reduced, if reduced dependence on import for key commodities. And the next step is fostering consumer confidence because we know that the anxiety about the future is one of the major reasons behind the reduced spending. Therefore, it is a time to boost the consumer confidence that can be done through strengthening social safety nets such as providing better healthcare at a low cost. This will definitely boost the consumer's confidence in the existing in, in the present social economic system. Therefore, he will be ready to spend more. The best initiative towards such a step is Aishman Bharat. And the next initiative is encouraging financial literacy and savings. This will encourage, this will promote financial literacy and uh, responsible saving among the consumers. And therefore, they, if they get the final financial literacy, then they will get to know how to manage the money. Therefore, it will reduce the stress around inflation. The best initiative towards this step is RBI's financial literacy program. So, in this topic, we discussed what is the key reason behind the reduced spending among the low and middle income households and what can be done to revive the demand. So, based on this idea, I try to answer this mains practice question. The question is, analyze the factors contributing to the recent decline in consumer spending in India. Discuss its potential impact on economic growth and suggest measures to stimulate consumer demand while maintaining physical while maintaining physical prudence try to answer this mains practice question and post it in the comment section we will review and reply for that thank you with this we are coming to the conclusion for our daily editorial analysis if you like the video hit the like button and give your feedbacks as comments and also share the content with your friends and before leaving this channel don't forget to subscribe and also hit the bell icon to receive the on-time update thank you